Ben and Me, Chapter 11, At Court Our voyage at last ended, although I was too far gone to know or care. By the time I had recovered, we were comfortably lodged in a house at Passé, a small town on the outskirts of Paris. Ben, for some unaccountable reason, proved to be tremendously popular with the French people. Scholars, scientists, and writers flocked to the house. They hung on his every word and talked of his lightning rods and kite flying as though they were something wonderful. Pictures of him were sold in all the shops while his maxims were quoted everywhere, in French, of course. To me, they made even less sense in French than in English. As for the admiration of the French ladies, it was just plain silly. They swarmed around him like flies around a honey jar. They all called him Papa and used to cry if he refused their invitations to tea or dinner. Our mail was filled with their ridiculous notes, all highly perfumed. Some of the ladies went so far as to copy the untidy way in which he wore his hair while others wore fur caps made in imitation of Ben's. One of them even tried to borrow my home for her milliner to copy. I put a stop to that promptly. We were surrounded by diplomats, politicians, and spies, all of whom were trying to find out what Ben was doing in France and, if possible, to prevent him from accomplishing it. Naturally, I was kept extremely busy watching all these people and telling Ben what they were up to. I became familiar with the desk of every ambassador in Paris, read each one's mail, and listened to all their conversations. Of course, with the information I supplied, Ben was able to thwart every plot against us, thereby gaining the reputation of being a brilliant diplomat. While I worked myself to a shadow, he was growing fat on all this attention, not to mention the dinners he continually attended. He did do his part at court, however. The king and queen were just as silly as the rest of the French in their admiration for Ben, his maxims, and his quaint clothing. They especially liked the fur cap, which, of course, he wore everywhere. By flattery and smooth-tongued promises, he managed to borrow millions of francs for George Washington and his ragged army. As long as we secured these vast sums for the cause of liberty and justice, I didn't mind how ridiculous he made himself, but the sociability was wearing me down. Ben, I said finally, I've just been thinking of one of your maxims. He that goes a-borrowing goes a-sorrowing. Now here you've come on one of the biggest borrowing expeditions of the age. But where's the sorrowing? You borrowed millions from the King of France, and you're still the most carefree old rapscallion I've ever seen. Every evening, it's dinner with Madame this or the Countess that. Fools make feasts, and wise men eat them, he said. All right, I said. All right. I won't try to match maxims with you. But this dinner thing is wearing me out, especially that Madame Helvetius, she and her cats. She has many important people at her dinners, he protested. She also has cats, I said, dozens of cats all over the house, and that pesky little yapping dog. My nerves are on edge all the time I'm there, Ben. I just can't stand much more of it. Besides, Suppose something horrid were to happen to me. How could you get along? What would happen to our mission, to our army, to General Washington? Ben looked thoughtful. There is much in what you say, Amos. Forewarned is forearmed. Moreover, I dislike those cats as much as you do. And as for the dog, yes, you are right, Amos. It is too grave a risk. From now on, we must dine less often with Madame Helvetius, and more often, perhaps, with Madame Brillian. Now, I said, you show some glimmer of sense. If we must dine out at all, let it be Madame Brillian, by all means. That's a lady for you. 
Not a cat in the entire house. Good food, too. So, to my great relief, we ceased our visits to Madame Halavitius and her cats, dining several times a week with Madame Brillian. This suited me perfectly, for in addition to the good food and charming surroundings, there was Sophia. Sophia was a very beautiful white mouse from the court of Versailles, an aristocrat and a lady if ever I saw one, a lady in distress as I soon learned. She lived in Madame Brillian's towering headdress, which made a really dainty home, very different from my rough frontier cabin type of residence. During the long, tiresome dinners, we visited back and forth a great deal. Her English was excellent, for she was beautifully educated, so we were able to converse freely. Having spent most of my life in the company of rather lowly church and tavern mice, I found her brilliant mind and delightful manners a revelation. I soon became her devoted admirer and slave. Well had she need of an agile mind and a strong right arm, for she had been a victim of the most villainous intrigues and persecutions by the white mice of the court. The story of her wrongs which she unfolded to me is too long to be set forth here. It is enough to say that as a result of a foul conspiracy, her husband, a member of one of the oldest mouse families in France, had been exiled to America, while she herself had been obliged to flee from the court, leaving their seven children captives in Versailles. Her poor husband was now in Philadelphia, struggling valiantly to make a home in the new world for his family, should they ever be reunited. Sophia, when banished from the court, had sought refuge with Madame Brillian, whose kindness to the unfortunate was well known. Here, in her protector's great wig, Sophia served her in much the same capacity as I did Ben. As advisor and confidant, she was of the greatest value to her patroness, and since Madame Brillian often attended the court, Sophia was able occasionally to secure news of her children's welfare. Although never able to see them, she learned that they were held in a small cell directly beneath the Queen's throne. Her one desire in life now was to rescue those unfortunate young ones and join her husband in America. But the task seemed well nigh hopeless. Not only was I touched by her beauty and helplessness, but all my Republican sympathies cried out against these wicked injuries by the pampered aristocrats of a dissolute court. Madam, I cried, do not despair. Though of humble birth, I have played no small part in the affairs of men and nations. What a mouse can do, I will. I, Amos, solemnly swear never to rest until your wrongs are righted and you are happily joined with your children and husband in our beautiful city of Philadelphia, USA. Tears filled the beautiful pink eyes at my words. Oh, Monsieur Amos, she said softly. Could you but accomplish this? What happiness would you bring to a bereft family? Fear not, madam, I said. To a true son of liberty and justice, such a task is a mere nothing. Have courage and trust in Amos. And we'll read the next chapter next time. Until then, as Tigger says, ta-ta for now. Love you guys. Thanks so much for listening. Bye-bye.